Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for joining our panel. Um, and thank you, Austin, for that introduction. As Austin said, um, we uh, are anti-maximalist kind of approach and see our tribe first and foremost being the tribe of crypto and of blockchain. Uh, and there's an incredible amount of innovation obviously happening here in Solana. Uh, outside of Solana, there has been, continues to be um, an incredible amount of innovation as well. So we just wanted to bring some of those folks uh, into, into Breakpoint um, and, uh, and look you know, beyond the Solana ecosystem a little bit and what are the innovations that um, are happening outside, how that relates to Solana. And uh, so myself, I'm Lily Liu um, with the Solana Foundation, um, have been uh, in and around the blockchain world since the Bitcoin days. Um, and have seen you know, various iterations from when it was contemplated to be a Bitcoin only world and then maybe a Bitcoin versus ETH world. And if you remember the lingo from a few years ago around you know, so-called ETH killers, um, my perspective has always been that there's room for more than one. And I think that that is you know, happening in various forms today and that's what we want to talk about. Um, and so if we, our panelists can also introduce uh, themselves. Hey everyone, my name is Sunny. Um, I've been working on the Cosmos ecosystem for about four and a half years, and now I'm working on a project called Osmosis, which is a interchain DEX. Hi everyone, I'm Min. Um, I'm the managing partner and co-founder of Ethereal Ventures. It's an early stage investment firm set up by the former venture team of Consensus. Um, we invest in multi-protocol applications, all ones through the stack, and really excited to learn more about the Solana ecosystem here. Hey, hey guys, I'm Zen, and I'm one of the co-founders of Taurus. We're a key management system that's simple and secure, and is used for on both wallets as well as applications all over the Web3 space. You guys might have used Binance Smart Chain Wallet, Kepler, or Kukai, or other numerous applications out there. We're down the line key management system to that, and uh, yeah, we've been doing this for about three years or so. Um. Great. So, you know, first off, uh, it's very clear that we're no, not going to be in a world which is only Bitcoin, only Ethereum. Um, but as we kind of see that landscape um, evolve, uh, how do you see that in terms of um, is this, you know, a world of three chains, three dominant chains, ten, infinite, right? Uh, and, you know, also how do you see that in terms of innovation truly sort of uh, with additional L1s, platform layer, or whether sort of innovation from here is primarily going to be at the application level? So, uh, let's start with you, Sunny. Uh, you know, Cosmos yeah. having been <laughs> thinking about this for a few years. Yeah, so I think um, my belief and I guess like, you know, the reason I started working on Cosmos is I do believe that there's going to be a world with not, not 10, but more like hundreds or thousands of blockchains. Um, and this comes, this stems primarily from the belief, my belief that like, we're gonna see a world of a proliferation of application specific blockchains. So instead of being like, you know, these layer one generalized protocols, and you have like, you know, hundreds and thousands of applications building on top of it, I think these generalized chains will, you know, stay around and they'll be applications building on top of them. But over time, more and more applications will graduate to becoming their own blockchain. And um, yeah, so and then once that happens, you're going to need to, you know, have these many, many blockchains. And then what we've been building for like many years is like the tools to make it so like get ready for a world of hundreds of blockchains. And that's where like the IBC protocol and all this stuff comes in. Got it. So Min, do you share that perspective that it's, you know, hundreds of blockchains or do you think it's more sort of around 10 on that order and then most of the innovation is going to be running on top of that? I think we believe in a very long range of use cases and that there are going to be many different approaches to suit the different developer preferences that can be, you know, use case specific, asset specific, um, you know, even to some extent like cultural or even geographical. Um, I think now that we have seen like successful app chains like Osmosis, um, I do think that you know it's non-controversial to think that there's going to be in a proliferation of them in the short term. Um, at the same time, though, I think we remain pretty excited about some of the innovation, possible innovation that happens on the L1 
side, especially as it relates to sort of consensus and execution. When you think about sort of privacy, privacy preserving L1s, um, you know, on the virtual machine side, like it feels like there's still a lot of room to innovate there too, and it's important that we do so. Do you have any thoughts, thoughts then? Well, um, just to add on, like I feel it boils down to really the fundamental difference of being an application chain relative to building on a platform chain itself. <laughs> Ultimately, I don't know, I kind of have the perspective that with regards to platform chains, in today's world you see all, only like several large platforms which really take like the keynote, and then it's a couple of them. It's like under 10 of them, like you know, Facebook, Google, and et cetera, and all that. But with, with, with applications, I, there, there will always be benefits to building an, a, a, like the underlying incentives and network layers towards your application itself um, versus the interoperability you get on a platform chain. So I think, I mean, I think the many will probably come from application chains, and there'll be a few platforms. That's my perspective, at least. Um, so given that we are at the Solana conference, um, do you think that there is a, a, a future where it's you know, highly performant chains, for example, um, you know, a, a number of Solana forked zones uh, interoperated by IBC? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think that the Solana software is probably the best layer one software that exists right now. And I, I bet it's only a matter of time until we start seeing people forking that software and using it to deploy new chains, right? Like we see it happen, we saw it happen with the EVM. You have like so many chains that are based off of the EVM. You saw it happen with like EOS, which at the time was like, you know, this is the scalable blockchain solution. And like, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before we see many chains launching with the Solana software and, you know, even like application specific chains, you know, if I want to build a social network, I, you know, what is Solana's TPS, like 4,000 TPS or something, I need all that TPS for my application, right? And so I'm going to go launch a social network using Solana software for my chain. Got it. Um, and Min, how do you see that interacting with uh, an EVM world, right? Because now as people are thinking about sort of multi-chain universes, there seems to be um, something around IBC, right? Something around uh, EVM. Um, and that that actually is, you know, a bit of the mode around, uh, around Ethereum in addition to sort of the adoption of the native chain itself. Yeah, I, I think we see, you know, there's definitely, I think, a bias in our universe for, <laughs> you know, EVM compatible models, which it feels like definitely will sustain. But at the same time, it, you know, things are about trade-offs. And, um, you know, we see a lot of our portfolio companies like wanting to go cross-chain, um, you know, at the same time, I think it's sort of balanced, right, between sort of existing dApps going cross-chain. A lot of it is also because of, you know, it's easier onboarding via other ecosystems right now relative to Ethereum um, versus, say, the proliferation of, like, you know, new app chains that, like, you know, also come from a cost and scalability point. The question is just, like, how long will that time period um, really exist and what's the longer-term reason for people wanting to do that? Um, one thing I think would really help, like people go cross-chain better, is just you know better dev tooling, um, a l better auditors, uh, a lot more of an ecosystem and infrastructure with uh, like enabling people to do that. Because I do think the curiosity is certainly there within our portfolio, and we've spoken to a lot of teams about it. Got it. Um, and so you know, as we think about uh, cross-chain compatibility, there's such a flourishing of bridges out there right now. Um, what do you think about sort of uh, using bridges versus standardized protocols? I know Cosmos has a perspective on this. Um, and what do you, how do you think the sort of bridging ecosystem is going to evolve? I think, um, so yeah, there's this like, you know, thing between like bespoke bridges and, um, you know, a generalized permissionless bridging protocol like IBC. And I think, the IBC model is designed for a world of those hundreds to thousands of blockchains because when you have bespoke bridges, um, you know, I think that model, like for example, I'd say wormhole is almost actually somewhere in the middle. It's like a, somewhere in between generalized and bespoke. And I think it's really well designed for a world of like, or for connecting, you know, the term I use is famous blockchains, which is like, you know, blockchains that have like high, you know, mind share and like people want to connect to them. But like, you know, if I'm launching a new chain that's very experimental, you know, it's not the easiest thing for me to go to the wormhole guardian set and be like, hey, please integrate my 
random chain that you've never heard of yet into Wormhole. And like, you know, an example I'd use is like, you know, let's say Terra wanted to integrate with Wormhole three years ago, back when it was just this tiny little fledgling project. Would it have? No, but like maybe, but today, you know, you, you can't predict what's going to be important years from now. And that's why IBC as this like permissionless bridging protocol that lets anything bridge together uh, is important. And I guess with the future of bridge protocols, I think what's cool is like, I, I actually see like, there'll be like a merging of these things. So I still think wormhole is important for a lot of reasons. I think it might even be like, you know, better for like bridging these like famous blockchains together, right? And so I think what I'd like to see happen is more of a unification of the application layer semantics of these bridge protocols. So in a bridge, you have like, you know, the data format of what's being sent over the chain. There's like, if I'm sending tokens over the over between two chains, you know, there's a format to that packet. Um, and it would be really nice if we could standardize these formats across Wormhole and IBC and, you know, whatever new bridge protocols come in so that to the application developers, they don't care which bridge they're running over. To them, it just feels the same. Mm. Mm. And I think standards are super important here, to be honest, because um, ultimately, when you're building on like when you're building on newer chains or your own application chain, you're building a lot of the infrastructure from ground up, and bridges are just part of that infrastructure that, with standards, really can help you like accelerate that process. Um, ultimately, I think that like uh, it's uh, but you know, hopefully the standards pan out. In web, it's panned out, but there's like 50 standards in web as well, and hopefully it's not the same with <laughs> right. bridges and yeah. in the uh, web3 space. Um, and in terms of value accrual to bridges, how do you see that playing out, Min? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question from an investment perspective, and we know being in the space that is very much driven by narrative, right? Like, and right now, bridging tech is kind of in its phase one narrative, and, you know, I think a lot of bridges, especially the sort of state-sponsored ones, are designed to sort of divert like liquidity from Ethereum. But it seems like right now that bridge is downward sloping <laughs> to Ethereum, to be honest. I don't think that'll be the case for the long term. Um, and we're pretty excited about seeing like sort of more credibly neutral modular bridges that will actually just create more like, you know, interstate highways, like what bridges are actually meant to do. Um, and with that, I think, you know, where um, would people sort of pay like bridge operators, like significant fees for that? I think we definitely think so, because um, at the end of the day, this is like, you know, zooming out, this is how like, you know, the Web3 world is supposed to look like. Do you think that, you know, the credibly neutral bridge is possible? Optimistically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, IBC is a credibly neutral bridge, right? Because uh, there's no like intermediary when you connect two chains with IBC. You have like chain A and chain B. Um, the bridge security is equivalent to the security of the chains themselves, right? Because they're using these like light client proofs, and I don't think you can get really more credibly neutral than that. Um, and how do we deal with, uh, there are so many bridges launching right now, one of the challenges with that is that you get fragmented liquidity. Um, and so if you look uh, within Solana, for, for example, today, you have so many different versions of USDC. You've got the native USDC, and sometimes you even double-bridged USDC, version one, version two. And so, you know, if you're uh, a liquidity provider, that's okay, because, you know, you can essentially farm the arbitrage. But for users outside of that, it's not so great, because you essentially fragment even the, the, the underlying stablecoin. Um, and so what are your thoughts around that? Do you think that is just something we're going to deal with and find a different way to abstract that? Um, or do you think that's a temporary solution that we will eventually sort of have more, uh, just better bridging solutions so you don't have double-bridged USDC, for example? I, I think for now, um, you know, I think things like Saber are like the patch that like helps solve that, where like, you know, if I have, um, you know, a wormhole bridge USDC, I can quickly convert that to like native Solana USDC uh, pretty easily. But I imagine that like over time, you know, the problem is the UI layer is really good at doing that, but the like protocol layers are not, right? I 100% like, agree with that. I do think it's probably a user experience uh, uh, thing here, and it's always the choice between showing it to the user and showing like what actual wrap token you have versus trying to hide that and then like saying that it's just USDC outright. You have 
different wallets taking different approaches depending on their audience of users. Um, and um, and I mean, so, so you it, think it's better it's, to show the user that there's different UI? I'm not. I'm not claiming it's better either ways. I, I actually feel like it's better for different audiences depending on that particular audience. Like if you're more mainstream, you're just getting into the space. You really don't care and you don't want to know. You'd rather be it, be it if it's cheap, of course, automatically swapped behind the scenes. <laughs> right? If you're somebody who's experienced, you're dealing with a lot of money. That's that's of course a different a different ball game altogether. Got it. Um, so if we switch to, so, you know, we've talked about sort of, there's going to be ten, hundred, thousands of chains, um, different ways these, uh, there's going to be interoperability. And so if we get to the application space, which is really, you know, what people are going to care about on an everyday basis, right? Um, what are sort of the use cases that are enabled with uh, improved cross-chain compatibility? Um, and, and also, you know, there are potentially use cases that we give up. Um, uh, by enabling sort of super fluidity cross change? I mean, ultimately, I think it actually um, derives down to what the application itself is trying to provide to its users. For example, an application like Rarible, which is an NFT marketplace, is looking to present all NFTs. And therefore, and that's the experience they want to provide. They don't want it on one particular ecosystem. They want it on all of them. So. For them, they have to go cross chain. It, it's it's like it's not it's not whether or not it's it's regardless of cost. That's the idea that they're moving towards because they want to provide that whole experience um, to 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 applications. But of course, it's I mean it's always a implementation cost versus uh, like the, the 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 overall end experience. An application which just provides an Ethereum experience or just a Solana experience or just a whatever experience may be. Uh, more polished overall. Yeah, I think um, you know, there's just like meme right now that like going cross chain will like break composability, but I just don't know if that's like really true, right? Like, you know, when you're, when you're building on a single chain, you get these like nice synchronous atomic transactions, which are really nice from like a developer experience perspective, but they are kind of inherently unscalable, right? Like. At some point, you're going to hit the limits, and you know today writing asynchronous like blockchain applications is annoying. But here's the thing: that was also annoying to write like asynchronous web applications 15 years ago. In JavaScript, you had to deal with that like callback hell and stuff. But like over time, the tooling has just gotten better, right? Like the 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 programming, like you know, we have these awaits in JavaScript now, and like you know, the user experience and the developer tooling just gets better and better to the point that like writing asynchronous code uh, for blockchains will be just as easy as writing synchronous code. And so I don't think you're going to lose that sort of uh, composability. I guess the only thing you do lose is flash loans, but uh, we're working on solutions for that. <laughs> yeah, I think like, you know, ultimately what Sunny's point is the right one, where there's quite a bit of composability fragmentation and liquidity fragmentation that happens cross-chain that I don't think we've quite figured out yet. We might. Um, so it's really the rationale, like, you know, are you trying to bridge assets, you know, bridge liquidity? Um, you know, I think there are definitely sort of like performance sort of trade-offs on like different chains that people can achieve. But it really sort of belies the importance of having that, you know, credibly neutral bridge again, because people don't want to go on a bridge that, you know, can suddenly be turned off by a multi-sig at the end of the day. And I think until we actually get to that level of decentralization that, you know, people actually start spending a bit more time on that. And we're excited to sort of see that because it underprints a lot of the philosophy of the developers in our space. Um. And so, uh, in terms of um, when, when do you think it kind of makes sense for uh, an existing DApp to go cross-chain? Uh, um, I mean, again, it's just dependent on what they're trying to provide, right? It's, uh, it's all applications try to provide something to their end users. <laughs> and if it's all NFT markets or if it's all loans on whichever cheapest, if it's a DeFi aggregator to give you the cheapest loan or the cheapest swap, um, that, that then they are going to have to go cross-chain. But it's, uh, yeah. yeah. I think it just boils down to use case ultimately. Yeah. And so, so Zen is someone at Taurus. You've, been, uh, you've built already BSC um, 
Kep uh, integrated with Kepler, which is Cosmos Wallet. So you've already spent quite a bit of time, and now you know clearly working on Solana. Um, and so, you know, how do you think about um, you know UX in a cross-chain environment as someone who's been kind of at the forefront of that? So actually, I do believe that UX is a tool and actually a layer on top of um, all of your different chains, which can be the layer that you abstract that lack of composability underneath on. For example, um, and, and for example, like you know, your your NFT marketplaces do this. Your 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 your, your various different um, your various different DeFi applications across different chains, like Curvefi and all, they do this. Um, and and that 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 UX level, if conveyed to the user in, because ultimately a lot of users don't really care what they're using sometimes, like underneath. Um, some people do care a lot, but they're also your know, bulk of the crowd, which care a little bit less. And ultimately, like if that, if if you're catering to that crowd, which cares a little bit less, you can use that UX layer to just say, hey, it's on this number of blockchains. This is the aggregate amount, and this is where your 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 assets lie, or something like that. You know, it's. Uh, and we've seen people go eye both ways. We've, mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of our more successful ones are definitely more um, crypto UX centric where because it's, you know, DeFi products and that was the main boom. But as NFTs and games have really started to churn out more and more, it's starting to see more and more applications go the other route towards that more mainstream user, that more casual, uh, like, uh, user, yeah. 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 Um, so then, uh, you know, if much of this complexity, you know, truly can be abstracted away from the end user, which arguably is where we need to be in a Web3 world in order to sort of have that same seamless and just very easy experience of Web2, um, then, uh, you know, there's kind of that age old question uh, what is the value accrual model to L1s? Um, because if you, if that ultimately gets abstraction to the background, then does that value come from uh, just the cult-like communities that exist around these L1s, irrespective of the sort of more functional utilitarian supply and demand for the for the token? Is it something where uh, you know if we can have a high enough percentage of the token staked and therefore illiquid? Then the sort of utilitarian demand plus the cult is what drives value, because uh, there's um, there's a paper that was at least very prominent in the Bitcoin Maxi circles in 2017 about an institutional investor's uh, perspective on cryptocurrencies and sort of advancing the argument that ETH should be worth 20 cents because uh, as kind of world computer utility would approach uh, that of. Uh, you know the the cost that it takes to rent space in, AD, in a, uh, off of AWS. Now, clearly, I, I think that just you know the facts of the world, um, ETH is not worth twenty cents. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yet, I think um, the there have there haven't been terribly cogent arguments um, as to how to think about the delta between twenty cents and forty five hundred dollars. So, where do you see that going? Uh, as you know, necessarily, once you get a billion users, a lot of this will be abstracted away. I think you know where we've seen um, with the L ones, and you know, I think there are uh, a lot of people almost underestimated L ones. Like you know, the last couple years, like how do we? The question is, will that sort of continue? Will we see more of them? Um, ultimately, it mat I think it depends on what people are paying for. Um, people aren't just paying for scarcity at the end of the day, they're also paying for data availability, for consensus, for execution. Um, and I think there are ways to sort of add in a lot of de deflationary me mechanisms um, into sort of like the token economy within L1s. Um, as, and I think it's especially exciting in like, you know, sort of L1s like, you know, Cosmos and um, Polkadot who have very, very different sort of architectures and design. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see, but uh, I, I'm not sure if I quite agree with that statement yet. I think we have some optionality there. Do you have a perspective on that, Sunny? Um, so, I think that, uh, I think that we all, we all want an ideal future where we can code an asynchronous code across all different blockchains. We can, uh, 
we can we can interact with one application and interact with the safest, the best, the fastest, the cheapest blockchain. Um, and we all want that kind of like ideal future. Users don't want to have to think about this. Obviously, they just want to buy their like you know their their NFT product, their CD. They want to play their game. That's all they want to do. And I, we can we can all and maybe like 20 years down the line we'll be there, but. Um, I think the core difference between building, you know, between building on an L1 and an L2 is probably like the infrastructure, the tooling, the 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 the, the ecosystem surrounding it, the, the 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 support, everything else that comes that is, uh, it's it's actually very tangible. It's not intangible by any means, but it it seems it's quite hard to quantify exactly what that is. I do think those that that. That ecosystem will surround probably, in particular, or that mind chair will surround only a select few applications and chains which come out of it. And I, I mean, to me personally, I do believe that Solana is probably one of them. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, it's, uh, and I think that's what is more important than talking about that ideal future 20 years down the line. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think. Uh, I think the, yeah, I, I don't know, I guess I'm a little bit of a skeptic on this, like, fat protocol thesis about L1s, unless the L1 really tries to push for, like, high levels of moneyness, um, and, you know, I think Bitcoin has done that, I think ETH has done that, I think, you know, Solana is, like, in the process of doing this, right, like, more things in the Solana ecosystem are starting to be denominated in Sol, so, like, you know, your NFTs are priced now in Sol, um, and I, I think, like, that, that sort of really... If you want, if you, honestly, I think that I, 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 it's the only layer one that I think has actually done fat protocol thesis correctly is Terra, because what they, but the, and it's because they started as a application specific chain, built an application and then are now building an ecosystem on top of it that like leverages their original application. And so I think that like is the proper flywheel uh, to be building. Got it. Um. And so if we uh, you know, switch, switch gears for a second, um, there's been this ongoing uh, kind of theme since you know, really the beginning of blockchain where I remember in 2015, uh, you know, the, the uh, nom de jour was private blockchains, right? Because there's always been this somewhat comfortable, a little bit uncomfortable relationship with uh, existing, whether it be Web2 companies, Fortune 500 corporates that kind of see the potential but feel very uneasy with uh, this like sort of radically open ecosystem that lives and breathes um, online, you know, around the world, and oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, using language that wouldn't necessarily sort of be in in a boardroom somewhere, right? Um, and so, you know, increasingly, I feel like um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain went from being sort of the outlier to now being sort of on the main stage and like the hottest kid at the party, which for me is a, personally a relief, but. Um, uh, you know, as we see, you know, the second wave, the third wave of basically established institutions getting into this, um, how do you think that is um, going to sort of be implemented given the technologies that we have and whether the technologies we have are sufficient? So is Facebook going to build on an existing chain like a Solana, right? Um, is Facebook going to build its own chain? Or I'm sorry, Meta, um, build its own chain. Uh, and, uh, you know, those that experimented with uh, the whole private blockchain world, the multiple solutions from IBM, um, where do you see them sort of slotting into the system given that I would say the thesis around open systems is, you know, once again prevailing? So uh, it's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I guess it depends, like with 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 with, uh, with 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 large enterprise chains which are coming out, like Meta, like uh, like um, I don't know, whichever other foreseeable like IBM or Hyperledger chain comes out or Bank chain. Um, I do think that it depends probably on the implementer on how open they would like those specifications and how interoperable they would want that to be with other chains in, in the grand ecosystem of things. Like Bitcoin, Ethereum and Solana and everything which will come after, which is kind of come from a bottom-up community effort 
always has that essence and that soul of interoperability, of being open, of like, you know, the, the, the developer spirit of open sourceness. Um, but I do think that it's, it may be a little bit different for some, especially like maybe the government chains, right? Like the, the China one that may be coming out, I don't know. Um, these, 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 in particular, these ones may be a little bit more closed off. Yeah. I mean, I think they're, you know, when we kind of think back like two years ago, right? Why did people want private blockchains? Like privacy is not an inherent feature of blockchain. So, you know, there's some empathy for like, you know, just sensitive consumer data and experimentation and sandboxes and what else. But I think what, you know, we kind of have to focus on is the evolution. And I think a lot of um, enterprises will probably focus on the privacy bit and forget that, you know, they are sacrificing global liquidity and like security and, and all the other benefits of having an open ecosystem. But some of them might. I think it'll be pretty cool, right? Where you sort of trade off like, okay, I can have a wall garden of all this like content and like permissioned apps, or I can actually just, you know, choose to create a monetary system within this open protocol and the price might be larger there. Um, you know, I do think some of the enterprises are wising up to like what they're trading off, um, but others will just sort of like remain wall gardens because that's what they're comfortable with. Yeah. I think them building these their like own chains, but in like an interoperable like ecosystem of chains is like a nice middle ground there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so you know this move the uh, the space moves at a mile a minute. Um, and, and so there's, you know, there's a flurry of activity around uh, interchain compatibility, bridging, um, and, uh, and what do you think is kind of the next topic that's going to arise in the ecosystem? Do you think it's going to be, I personally think that privacy is going to be, be a big one, right? Um, and also privacy as you bridge, I think is going to be a topic that comes up. Um, I don't know if you agree with that thesis that you know, privacy is sort of the next thing that we really need to think about in all of its various forms and also moving the narrative away from privacy is somehow you're, you have something to hide, but rather just that uh, there is, you know, many legitimate um, reasons why you want to have privacy over your information and how you trade um, and you don't necessarily want all of your trades to be, you know, totally transparent on, you know, Etherscan or whatever it might be. Um, and so I guess two-part question, um, what do you think kind of the next uh, area of interest is going to be, right? That we, you know, we have these kind of themes that come up every three to six months as, as an industry. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess first part question is that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, so yeah, so I, I mean, I agree 100% on the privacy one. Uh, when we started Osmosis, that was actually sort of our goal was like, how do we build a fully private DEX or as practically private as uh, is efficient. Um, and actually, the first thing that we kind of like leaned into was uh, like front running and MEV resistance. And I actually treat that as a type of privacy because the yep. front running happens because of a lack of privacy at the mempool layer. The fact that everyone can read each other's transactions is a privacy failure, in my opinion. And so that's sort of what we've been working on on this like, we have something called threshold encryption, which we're working on as a way of encrypting all the transactions at the mempool layer. But then how this relates to cross-chain is, I think this solution is really good for like single chain front running resistance. But once you get into a world where transactions are happening cross-chain and like they do one thing on one chain that triggers something on another chain, then you start to get some new MEV introduced again. And so I think the next step, you know, one of the things I'm thinking a lot about right now is like, you know, while we're building our single chain front running resistance, how do we do cross chain MEV resistance? Yeah. Um, and so, Min, I don't know if you, if you would agree with my thesis that that's kind of the next large area that we need to figure out. And uh, I think that will also be conveniently or inconveniently sort of um, coinciding with, you know, just ever more regulatory attention on this space. And there's, I think, a conflict point there. Um, and so, I don't know what you think that is the next area, um, and if so, um, how you see that uh, playing out? 
Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we've been investing in privacy for the last couple of years and we'll continue to be investing in privacy for the next few years. And there are a lot of, you know, I, I think we, we, we remain very optimistic on ways to make that regulatory compliant as well because ultimately it's protecting user data. And like, you know, the optimist in me would like to believe that the regulator is aligned with, uh, you know, that philosophy. Um, you know, definitely agree on Sunny's point on, um, you know, where privacy breaks at the bridge and you know we just don't really know on the bridging side like how to actually enable sort of like you know private cross-chain communication um, one thing that you know another area that we're spending a lot of time on is identity and reputation um, you know I think it's a little bit of misnomer in the space because identity sort of means like 10 to 15 different things from like a subcategory perspective but Ultimately, you know, being able to create personalized contextual um, user experiences across applications, across like ecosystems is super important. I mean, I think there's this sort of obvious one of capital efficiency in DeFi for sure. But I think as you get to NFTs, like, you know, how do you actually make it more, a more sort of enriching experience, like, you know, based on sort of user data, but doing so in a Web3 native way. Um, you know, we're spending a lot of time, like, you know, with teams who are innovating at the forefront uh, of identity and also data availability and storage. Um, and so I imagine this is uh, a topic that you think about quite a bit. Uh, I do. Tourists, you guys I do, are, I do. Um, yeah. and in particular, because we sit in between Web 2 and Web yes. 3, we do have faced that problem quite a bit. And I mean, it's interesting because while blockchains are so public, cryptography, which is the underlying fundamental aspect, encryption and all, started bec with authentication, with privacy in mind. And we've evolved to this point. Um, I think privacy has been a hot topic for a while, to be honest. Like with, uh, and and it has like had huge advances with with zk proofs as well as, as the MPC side with threshold encryption. Um, I think things like Aztec are pretty cool as well. Big fans of them. Um, and I'm only hopeful for the future in terms of the, the, the technology and optimizations that can help us get to the point where we can hide what we want to hide and show what we want to show. Um, and uh, I do think it's, uh, yeah, it's a big problem. We need to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think uh, we might uh, be at the end of our time slot. Um, do you have any sort of closing thoughts or closing, given that we are at the sort of Solana conference? No? Good. I'm just really excited about Solana and like, you know, I think um, just all the scaling innovation that's been going on within the Solana ecosystem, I'm just really excited about it. And it's like, yeah. Honestly, the vibe here has just been fantastic. Like, you know, Breakpoint is supposed to be a celebration, and it really feels that way. It's, it's crazy. Um, like, uh, like, like, my teammates are here, and we can't even get tickets as well. It's <laughs> so it's it's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Cool. Likewise, I mean, it's been such a pleasure speaking with so many developers here and look forward to talking to more. Um, very excited about the NEON launch and I think, you know, the use case, cross-chain use cases we'll see there. Um, so I think it'll be an exciting next few days. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>